I'd like to call this meeting of the Brooklyn City Council to order. Mary Joe, can you please call the roll? Mary Beltier. Here. Kenneth Tansky. Here. Mark Blitzky. Here. Ryan Van Kirk. Here. Tony DeMarco. Here. Debbie Tomasco. Here. Kathy Pucci. Here. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have some approval of minutes for the meeting dated October 10th, 2017. Any comments or questions? Yes, I'd like to be Yes. Um, yeah, I had made a couple of comments and uh, changes in what was reported as my having said, and I don't see that they're reflected. So I guess I would like to ask that we wait another week or two weeks, another meeting to approve them. Uh, for the first time last meeting, what I said, I actually read. So usually I just talk, that's how I read. So I have what I said, and I would like to have what I actually said represented as opposed to an interpretation of what I said. So I would ask that they be held off no problem waiting until the next meeting for that. Any other, any other council members have anything to say? Any objections to that? Okay, we'll hold off to the next Thank meeting. You. You're welcome. Good evening. Thank you for being part of our council meeting. Before the start of tonight's meeting, I need to address a couple of topics that were brought to my attention by the law department of the city following our previous council meeting. During the summer, council met in several special council meetings and updated our rules of council. These rules are designed to, secure, to ensure council actions and meetings are appropriate and beneficial to the city. The current set of rules were adopted on July of 2017 and include the following rules that were adopted in 2012. Rule 11, the right of floor. When any member is about to address the council, a member shall request permission from the presiding officer and shall confine him or herself to the question under debate, avoid personalities, and refrain from impugning the motive of any other member's argument or vote. Rule number 15, public participation. Any member of the audience who wishes to address the council during public session must stand at the podium providing clearly state his or her name, residence address, and the subject matter he or she wishes to discuss. Participants must address the council when speaking. No public session participant will be allowed to engage in debate with any member of council, the administration, or any other member of the audience. The council president may not recognize any member of the public who attempts to speak from any location other than the podium. Public participation will be limited to five minutes per person. Public session participants shall observe the same rules of decorum and good conduct applicable to members of city council. Speakers must be courteous in their language and avoid personalities. Anyone making personal attacks, profane or slanderous remarks, or who becomes disruptive or combative while addressing city council or while attending a public meeting shall be reprimanded or removed from the meeting by the council president. The last couple of meetings, these rules were violated, and I wanted to ensure that some that the same did not happen here tonight. Since many of the remarks were directed at me in the last meeting, I did not reprimand or stop anyone from speaking as to not to appear that I was doing so to shut down opposing voices. This could not be further from the truth. I would not do that. And I understand this is an election time, and people are very passionate about their positions. I love that passion. I encourage open debate and dialogue. However, please keep in mind that there is much more that unites us than divides us. And it's imperative that we avoid being combative or slanderous. I'm informing all present tonight that these rules will be enforced. I'm not anticipating any issues, but I wanted to state the position of council rules at the outset of tonight's meeting. Next up on our agenda is a proclamation by the mayor, so I'll turn it over to her at this time. Good evening, everyone. This is one of the best parts of my job. I want to invite Rob Hennings up, Robert Hennings up here. I can't, I can't call you Roberts, Bob. <laughs> yeah, wherever you want. Um, we're here for a proclamation to recognize Robert Hennings on his retirement from the City of Brooklyn Service Department. Whereas Bob, a Brooklyn resident, began his career as a laborer with the City of Brooklyn Service Department on December 5th, 1988 and retired on September 1st, 2017. And whereas Bob also served as a volunteer firefighter from August 1st, 1984 until September 1st, 2002 and from when January 13th, 2000 until July 10th, 2004 served as a dog warden. Bob became the city arborist on November 29, 2010, whereupon he helped to educate grade school classes on the benefits of trees. 
And whereas Bob is an active member of the Brooklyn School Board, the Brooklyn Athletic Boosters, and has given his time to the City of Brooklyn Memorial Day parades and ceremonies, Fall Festival, along with the Chamber of Commerce Picnic in the Park, and many other city and school events. And whereas Bob is also a Staff Sergeant in the United States Army Reserve Special Operation Forces, and has been and will continue to be a tremendous asset to the City of Brooklyn, applying his knowledge and time for the betterment of our community. Now therefore, I, Mayor Gallagher, on behalf of Brooklyn City Council, hereby extend a sincere thank you and congratulations to Bobby Hennings for his service to the City of Brooklyn. You will be missed. <coughs> Mr. Berber wants to say a few words, and then Bob, if you want. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Bob, I just want to say that uh, everybody at the Service Garage um, and the residents of Brooklyn and myself definitely appreciate all your hard work throughout the years. You were definitely a man that was always uh, able to answer the bell when we needed you, and you did many, many different tasks at the garage, and we really, really appreciate it. And congratulations on your retirement, and I'm sure we will definitely see Bob around, no doubt about it. First, I'd like to thank the mayor and the council for this. I appreciate this a lot. This will go right next to my father's as uh, one of the first retired firefighters, full-time firefighters for the city of Brooklyn. I wish I had my uncles, who was one of the first full-time police sergeants here back in the 40s. But uh, thank you all. Um, I want to thank John for always having the faith in me to get the jobs done and done right. Um, I know it's not easy trusting someone with trees not falling on their houses, but he trusted me and I never dropped one tree on anybody's house once. Um, I want to thank Marty Greeny and Tom Bruzak for being two of the best foremans I had the opportunity to work for. They never doubted anything that I brought to them. They always supported me with everything that I wanted to do. Um, I want to thank Marty and Tom both for giving me the best partner in Jerry Essig Jr., a partner and as a friend. Um, I, could, I can't ask for anything more than what they did for me. Marty never, never doubted anything that I could do. He always supported me, and I, I thank that in Foreman. Um, there is two other people that I wish I had the opportunity to thank. One would be Joe Pucci, who went to John Coyne back in... 1984 and asked for the job for me. Um, tell Frank, you know, thanks. And uh, I'm not sure where they're at, up there, down there, wherever, but, you know, thank you, uh, thank you, John Coyne and Joe Pucci for, you know, helping, helping a guy out. So, to the men of the service department, good luck. Carry on with the same tradition that you always have for the last 50 years. And uh, thank you all. I appreciate it. Mr. Hennings, and congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. At this time, we will have a public session. If anyone in the audience has anything to say for the good and welfare of the city of Brooklyn, please step forward, state your name and address, and you'll be recognized. Please remember to keep your comments to five minutes or fewer. My name is Earl Bloom, 4720 Forest Edge Drive. I'm here to ask your support for Issue 58, the Permanent Improvement Levy for the Brooklyn Schools. On November 8th ballot, a PI levy for one and a half mills will be on it. One mill is a renewal, and a half mill is new. Now, the one mill has been on the books for 45 years. Because it is a renewal, we will pay the same amount now as 45 years ago, which amounts to $8.58 per year for a house with a $100,000 valuation. <clears throat> there is no increase in your property tax for this portion of the levy. Now the one, one half mill is a new tax. Because it is new, the tax is based on present evaluation. For a house with a $100,000 valuation, this amounts to 
and 50 cents per year increase. And this amount will not change in succeeding years. Now what can the PI money be used for? It can't be used for salaries, benefits, or daily operations. It can only be used for maintenance and infrastructure. One of the target areas is roof repair in the old high school, which is 55 years old. The roofs in the high school are leaking, and in some areas there are buckets collecting the water in some of the high school classrooms. Now some questions have been asked as to why these roofs haven't been fixed before. They have been. Throughout these many years, roof repairs has been an ongoing thing. But just like in your homes, you reach a point where maintenance will not cut it, and you have to do replacement, be it your roofs, your furnace, or whatever in your home. And these are commercial flat roofs, so the cost is much higher than a house type of shingle roof. This is what the school is faced with now. They have to replace the roofs in the high school, and it is estimated that a total replacement will cost over $1 million. Now some questions have been asked about what happened to the, mo to the money left from, over from the bond issue to build our pre-K to seventh grade new school and why this money was not used for roof repairs. Again, roof repairs have been an ongoing thing for many years. The bond issue was a fixed total amount of money and there was little amount of money left. In examining the roofs, it was discovered that the leaks in the auditorium stage area were caused by the stage rigging which was hung from the roof. In addition, the rigging has been deemed unsafe to use due to old age. Now this auditorium area is heavily used for plays, musicals, concerts, and other activities, so it needed to receive immediate action. The leftover bond money is being used to fix the auditorium roof and rigging. Now the PI money can be used in technology. Again, our high school is 55 years old and technology upgrades are needed to keep our students' education competitive in today's environment. Another area the PI money could be used for is the lighting in the high school. It's old too. Installing new lighting would result in significant yearly savings and energy costs. This levy is the first increase in the permanent improvement levy in 45 years. Use of PI money for maintenance and repairs means the school will not have to use its operating funds for these items, which would impact our children's education. The most important asset we have in our city of Brooklyn is our children. A strong school system means that Brooklyn is an attractive place for people to move into and keeps our property values up. Everyone benefits but most importantly, it benefits our children. I urge everyone to support Issue 58, the permanent improvement levy for our school, our city, and most importantly, our children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. My name is Hussein Orbadi. I live at 4427 West 62nd Street, Brooklyn Acres. I'm very discouraged. As a result of watching the Brooklyn City Council meeting on Tuesday, October 10th, 2017, I find myself disappointed and disheartened. I'm disappointed because we can no longer dialogue with civility, because our disrespect of each other is obvious, public, and readily accessible to our children. Because we view any level of disagreement as a personal affront to our identity. Because we cannot have a free exchange of ideas with a mutual respect for both parties. I am disheartened. Because of name calling. Because of random accusations defaming personal character. Because of nonverbal cues that imply deep resentment. Where 
Where has our brotherhood gone? Brooklyn isn't the site of national politics. Greater Cleveland does not find its identity in big city politics of another. We have a simple, hard-working way of life. And so where do we go from here? As I stand here before you, I too believe I have work to do in my own life. I don't believe that I've mastered all human behavior, nor conduct, but I'm going to try. With that said, I do believe if we can learn to stand in brotherhood with a mutual respect for each other, then the best years for this city are still to come. The choice is yours. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Obama. everyone, Vic Gardito, 7439 Outlook Avenue, uh, two things, uh, you're talking about street repair again. South Amber is a, pretty much a shambles, anybody from the city that's gone down there knows quite well. They repaired two of the worst sections this summer, which was great, they're pretty much in front of two people's driveways. Um, is it South Amber coming up on the list soon, I hope? It's turning into, be funny, but the Ho Chi Minh Trail, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's horrible. Uh, second point is we're also off about office space. Always want office space. Any reason they're not trying to build office space where they want to put up a hotel now in Tiedemann? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eden. Mike Prochko, 11040 Garden Drive, Arm, Ohio, 44130 former resident of Brooklyn for 27 years and current patron of the Brooklyn Rec Center. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, council, mayor. I recently surveyed the directors of eight local recreation centers. Each city I contacted responded promptly and gladly shared the information I requested. My goal was to gather data on the cleaning and maintenance of their indoor pools to present to you for comparison. The City of Middleburg Heights Recreation Center does a complete drain and refill of their indoor pool twice a year, once in the spring and once in August. They do a deep cleaning during that time and any equipment repairs are made. Both Brunswick and North Olmsted Recreation Centers drain and clean their pools on an annual basis. Fairview Park's Gemini Center plans to drain and clean their pool every one to two years. Both Seven Hills and Strongsville change their water in their pools every two to three years or more often as needed. When the city of Brook Park had their pool open, they changed the water once a year. The recreation centers mentioned do a complete shutdown of their facilities for a week or two while the maintenance is being performed. However, despite the annual facility closures, each of those rec centers appear to keep their current patrons happy while actively attracting new patrons every year. This is how Brooklyn used to operate many years ago. The City of Brooklyn John M. Coyne Multipurpose Recreations Indoor Pool has not been completely drained, cleaned, painted, nor refilled with new water since 2007. 2007, that's over 10 years swimming in the same chemical bath. 10 years of hairspray, deodorant, sweat, bodily fluids, baby accidents, and God only knows what else contaminating the water. Anyone who uses the pool on a regular basis can plainly see the chemical film floating on top of the water and smell the intensity of the chemicals emanating from the pool. The water is far from being clean. However, Brooklyn's recreation director states, and I quote, as long as our chemicals are well maintained, there is no need for us to drain the pool, end quote. Well, if that's the case, then why are all these other recreation centers changing the water and cleaning their pools on a regular basis? These aren't dirty facilities I'm comparing here. They're top of the line, well maintained, and well attended rec centers 
as Brooklyn once was. I was also told by Brooklyn employees there is no plan or budget funding available to drain and refill the indoor pool any time in the foreseeable future. One employee even went as far as to say, well, if we drain it, it's never going to get refilled again. How long does the city intend to let this go unaddressed? I realize the city's needs to cut expenses where they can, but going 10 years without cleaning a swimming pool, that's ridiculous. I'm sure the cities mentioned have tight budget restraints as well, but they are still able to afford regular preventative maintenance of their facilities. I ask you, why is it acceptable to continue operating our recreation center at a level of, a level of maintenance and cleanliness far below the standards set by our neighbors? The patrons of the Brooklyn Recreation Center, a few of which I see here tonight, pay for and deserve better than this. Thank you for your attention. Anyone else have anything to say for the good of all the city of Brooklyn? Andy Sauber. I live at 9732 Memphis Villas Boulevard, Brooklyn, Ohio. Thank you for the time tonight to talk. At the last council meeting, there was much discussion about a letter that went out supporting me for city council. This letter was no different than a letter that was sent out in 2015 mayoral election that read from the desk of Mayor Richard H. Belbeer. On the bottom of it, it had a disclaimer from the candidate he supported, also who also paid for that piece. I'm not here to debate or get into arguments. This is a city council meeting for the good and betterment of this city. If you disagree with me, fine. I'll listen to you in a civil discussion. However, I've been labeled as a yes man by people that have never even taken the time to talk to me. I've walked the city twice almost already this year. If I was unable to connect with you, please don't hesitate to call me at 216-548-7644 if you have any questions. I think my background supporting and giving back to this community during my time on council and various organizations speaks for itself. I was, a, was able to attend the end of this um, last school board meeting about bullying. In my work with Nick and Joanne Morales with Campus Life in the past four and a half years, I've had the privilege of working with and mentoring many Brooklyn students. Besides bullying, we deal with so many other issues plaguing our children today, including discipline, cutting, drug usage, and crime. On top of that, some of these children don't even have enough food at home. These issues are happening every day here. These issues are the ones we need to keep in the back of our mind as we are conducting ourselves at these public meetings. City Council and administration need to be role models for the next generation growing up in Brooklyn. The last council meeting was not a good example for them to follow. I may have been known as the quiet one. That does not mean my brain has been poisoned, as mentioned by a few, trying to degrade my integrity and character. If I am quiet, I'm probably listening to you to speak and being polite, but it does not give you the right to create your own dialogue and misconceptions about me. City Council needs to get to back to work for working for the citizens of this community. Thank you. South Amber Drive. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm one of eight candidates running for Brooklyn City Council. Big election coming up in 15 days on November 7th. We currently have an administration led by the mayor and council president who are desperately trying to load our city council with exactly the people Andy Selberts just mentioned. Yes, men and women. To achieve total control of our city and pass anything they want regardless of the will of the voter. 
For example, how many of you know that if issue three would have passed, you would have lost your right to vote on any future PUD developments? <clears throat> If it wasn't for myself and my daughter building a self-funded, immensely successful grassroots campaign, we would have lost Memorial Park and our right to vote. Make no mistake about it, issue three was a brilliant, strong-arm power play to take control away from the voters. Now, uh, Mr. Selvert's also mentioned, yes, people. Mr. Tiansky, this is not a personal attack, no matter what you think. This is your voting record. For the year 2017, not a single no vote on any ordinance, not one, through September. For the year 2016, not a single no vote on any ordinance, not one. Unfortunately, 2015 stats are not available at this time. For the year 2014, only one no vote on an ordinance for the entire year, and your no vote was against the city trying to negotiate to save money. So for three years of available data, Mr. Shansky's voting record is approximately, give or take, 268 yes votes to one no vote. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the very definition of a yes man. Ms. Politsky, a beloved member of our city, and although she's not running for council, she has also never voted no on a single issue since she's been elected. Now, this part's tough. Mr. Selhurst, who's a very popular yet two-time defeated candidate for city council has crossed the line that no resident or appointed, again not elected, community investment corporation committee member should ever have crossed. Let me explain. Do you all remember these yard signs that went up, vote oh, yes on issue three? These were all over the city. Um, as my daughter and I were running to defeat issue three, I got a little depressed because these signs were everywhere. So I went to the Board of Elections and I asked them, who is the Friends of Issue 3? And it turns out the Friends of Issue 3 were not Brooklyn residents. It was Geist Construction that paid for all of those signs and all of that campaign literature. The same construction company that already profited $50,000 for a feasibility study and would stand to make millions of dollars in profit off the backs of Brooklyn taxpayers. Now the unpleasant part. Mr. Selhurst was the only resident to contribute, but he didn't just contribute. He did something a little bit more almost on the deceptive side. According to the Board of Elections, and this is the form that I blew up, Mr. Selhurst was the treasurer for the Friends of Issue 3. He was the treasurer for Geist Construction for that super PAC. He had to go to the Board of Elections, open the Political Action Committee, with a mere $50, which allowed Geist Construction to then deposit all of the money into the account to pay for the yard signs, the door-to-door -door literature, the mailings, for everything. And when, when the vote was over, he got his $50 back. Again, issue three would allow Geist Construction to profit millions of dollars and in the process destroy our park and take away our right to vote. Now Mr. Selhurst is running for a third time. How in the world can any of us remotely trust him when he's already clearly in bed with Geist Construction? It's right here, there's no dispute, there's no debate. I have the form directly from the Board of Elections. With this supermajority of city council in the mayor's back pocket, she can then steamroll all of us and rule Brooklyn in completely, in complete and total control, our system of checks and balances destroyed. Elect those that did not campaign, vote, or lie in bed with the construction company who would have profited millions, who also wanted to steal your right to vote and grant all power to themselves. And like those that want to represent you, the residents of Brooklyn, not the will of this administration. Please vote to Musco, Balbir, myself, and Ms. Pucci on November 7th. And also, very important, Please, please, please support issue 58 for the Brooklyn School Levy. Get out and vote, folks. Thank you. <clears throat> Meg Ryan Chalky at 7440 Woodhaven Avenue. Last 
Last week, I attended the PACT Board of Education meeting. The meeting started with recognizing four high school students for being leaders in our athletic programs, both on and off the quarter field. These student, students told the audience what they learned and what inspired them in a workshop they attended in Columbus. Then, I listened to a plan of action that several leaders and advocates working for the school started last year to combat the serious issue of bullying in the Brooklyn schools. Webster's Dictionary defines bull a bully as a noisy, blustering fellow, more insolent than courageous, who threatens, intimidates, or badgers people who are smaller or weaker than he is. Bullying can take place in many different formats, including but not limited to physical, verbal, and cyberbullying. During the public forum part of the night, that night, countless parents got up to talk about bullying mainly verbal and physical, that their own children have experienced in our schools. While the bullying problem in our schools is serious, this problem goes beyond the schools that our children attend. It is occurring on social media pages representing Brooklyn and its residents, and even at our city council meetings. The four students that I mentioned earlier showed more maturity and leadership than some of the adults in this community. Children learn more from watching adults than they do from lectures that adults will give. What kind of role models are we being for the children of this community? Better yet, what kind of role models do we want to be for the children in our community? I think it is time for all of us, leaders, residents, and students, to think about what example we are setting for those who look up to us. Sasserchi, 4720 Autumn Lane. In the uh, First Amendment of our U.S. Constitution, it states in part, Congress shall make no, make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of press or the right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. And the 14th Amendment makes that applicable to state and local levels of government. It states, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state, I might add, or locality, deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. The rules are very important for guidance, but when strategically brought forth and, and, and reiterated in, in specific experiences they can be a way to intimidate people and to chill open and honest dialogue. I suggest that if anybody on this council finds that any form of chastisement brought forth by a person of this community to be too much, then perhaps you ought not be sitting up here. A second issue, oh, and, and also I just wanted to uh, bring one distinction that was glossed over uh, regarding letters of endorsement. Um, yes, I did see a letter of endorsement from several years ago. Um, it stated clearly on the top, from the desk of the mayor, it did not say Brooklyn City Council. That That is a misleading language. Um, that was de a deceptive to this, the the uh, residents of this community, and I might also comment that attorneys have a code of ethics, where in which it states that they should never act uh, and to give the appearance of impropriety. That letter, with that letterhead, was impro improper. It did give the appearance of impropriety, and whether it was used for six years or one year makes no difference. If you are a burglar and you've been breaking into houses for six years and are finally caught breaking into that next house, doesn't make those previous six years any more improper than the one you were caught on. 
The second issue I'd like to bring to the City Council is the issue regarding a school crossing guard at the corner, at the intersection of Ridge Road, West 66th Street and Hurricane Alley. It's a wide intersection. There's a three-part traffic signal there. The streets don't align. So left-hand turning traffic is far away from crosswalks where our little ones are going to and from school. Uh, when are we going to put a, a, a stu uh, crossing guard there again? Are we going to wait for a tragedy with one of our little ones going to and from school? I understand that a, a crossing guard used to be there when Brookridge School existed. Just because it was demolished doesn't change the nature of that intersection. And the students of, of Brooklyn Acres and those that live in the uh, southeast corner of the intersection of Ridge Road and Memphis, around Hammond Avenue and Newberry, they deserve just as much protection as the rest of the children going to Brooklyn schools. They are not second class students. And I would like whoever is responsible for making that decision in the past to re readdress it and, 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 and bring it up before council again. Thank you. Is there anyone else that's going to say for the good and well for the city of Brooklyn? Uh, Paul Fordor, 4721 Rodone Road. Um, I'm not a very bright person. Um, and to my shame, I, I don't uh, get to these chambers uh, because of, of my work. I'm a, a builder, high-end general contractor. Um, but what, what I've uh, witnessed, I, I do go online once in a while and watch the meetings. And last week I was quite disturbed, and as well as tonight with, with uh, some of the victoral speech um, I have a copy of the letter from uh, Ron Van Kirk and the mayor of the last election, and they're identical. And this witch hunt uh, to impugn, impugn this council president is misguided. And um, I would just like to, um, as one of the other residents, um, uh, and, I, and I basically, I just want to... Um, Anyone who's competed for anything in life, okay, we all have pedigrees. We go out and get degrees and, and awards, and we strive for that. We're, we're taught to do that. We're encouraged to do that. But, but it seems like then it, 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 it forms us. We, 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 that's what makes us, and, and, and we think that's all there is to us. But really, after you achieve that, um, um, I have a father-in-law. You don't see his trophies. He walks with humility, but but and he doesn't have to preach about it and 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 wear it, uh, you know, shove it down people's face. And he's willing. What well, I guess what I'm trying to say, kind of awkwardly, is that we need to get back to civility. It doesn't matter your pedigree, folks. If if you're not willing to come down here and sweep this carpet after this meeting then you're not willing to serve. And that's for all of us, myself included. When I walk my dog, I pick trash up because I like this community I live in. I pick the trash up and I carry it to the next receptacle, no matter where that is. It, it's just habit. Uh, and, and there's character traits that, that we need to go back to. Benjamin Franklin, I'm gonna, and, and I'm gonna end with this. Um, and, as I was saying, in competition, uh, when I compete in things, if let's take the playoffs, when, when our, our Lindor, you know, our home run slugger, he gets in a slump. Well, if he doesn't have self-awareness enough, and his coaches don't have self-awareness enough to say, hey, something's not working, you have to go back to the basics. And in America, uh, We've gone away from civility. We've gone away from the basics of, of just human dignity, how we dress, how we carry ourselves, how we communicate, how we show respect. And I like this about Benjamin Franklin. 
he carried a, a, a sheet of paper in his pocket and it basically had 13 uh, character traits, temperance, okay, a form of self-control, silence, speak, not but what may benefit others and speak with respect, um, order, let all things have their places, resolution, be resolved, have resolve, but we can all differ, but at the end of that, don't get emotionally attached to it. Okay, so you don't get the, win the election. Well, you still have to work together. We're a team, we're a city, we're a team, we're all a team, okay? And we have to let go of that. Yes, I, you want the gold ring, but you didn't get it. So let's work together and let's, it, let's support those who are in charge. And we have to have some trust. I hear this language, that this issue three, there's a lot of lies and, 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 and I, uh, about this issue. Um, and, and, uh, um, and people are getting all incensed uh, over, over a, a lot of nothing. Um, uh, so, so basically, I just want to say, you can disagree. You can come up here and disagree with council. Council, you can disagree with each other. But what I witnessed at last meeting, and, and I wasn't here, and I apologize for that, was, was not a, a, a good... Uh, a good display. Um, um, so, if, if we disagree, let's do it in a in a uh, civil matter, and and uh, and oppose each other. But at the end of the day, uh, let's have respect for one another. Let's keep civility, folks. Okay, it's a great community. Thanks for. Hey, what else can I say for the good and welfare of the city of Brooklyn? We now move on with reports of committees, commissions, and boards. We begin this evening with our recreation board, Councilwoman Belvere. Thank you. The last Monday we had the recreation board meeting. Uh, we all met, and a couple things we were discussing. Um, this next skating session is going to start November 4th, and it runs through January 6th. If anyone has any questions about any of the classes or anything, please call the rec center at uh, 351-5334. The Brooklyn Recreation Department, in cooperation with the Brooklyn Police and Fire Departments, are presenting Frightening Friday Night Hollow Scream Skate. And that's going to be Friday, October 27th during Open Skate, uh, roughly around 8 o'clock to about 9.15. The cost is free admission to current Brooklyn residents with an ID, and that's holders wearing a costume and donating a Thanksgiving-related canned good for the City of Brooklyn Thanksgiving Basket. And what they do is they, they round up all these canned goods and they take them over to the senior center. And I guess they start off over here at the uh, uh, city hall and then they make baskets for the needy. And how wonderful that is and how you teach children that. You're skating, you're having a good time, bring that canned good and you're going to help a family. Wonderful. So non-residents will be admitted for resident rates at about $3 for admission if you're wearing a costume and donating a Thanksgiving-related canned good for the holiday basket. Um, also, there's a bunch of uh, new skatings. Every month they're, they're having a new theme for skating, and it's Fridays from 8 to 9.15. In October, like I just mentioned, it's called Hollow Scream Skate. In November, the theme is the 90s night. In December, it's the Ugly Christmas Sweater Night. In January, it's the Roaring Twenties, Great Gatsby. In February, it's Pajama Night. In March, it's St. Patrick's Day Night. April is Cleveland Sports Night. And May 4th is Cinco de Mayo. There's also a neat thing happening there at the uh, rec center, and it's great for kids in the age group of 3 to 10-year-olds. It's called Try Hockey for Free for a Day. So if you have any children in the age group, Three to, three to ten years old. It's going to be Sunday, October 29th from 12 to 1. They can try, come out and try to see if they'd like to pursue a career in ice skating and hockey. And like I said, any questions, please call 351-5334. And that pretty much concludes my report. Thank you. Next up is Planning Commission, Councilman DeMarco. Uh, the next meeting of the Planning Commission is scheduled for Thursday, November 2nd, 2017 at 6 p.m. in the Brooklyn uh, City Hall Conference Room to hear the following request from Repros 
for one internally illuminated cabinet sign and a vinyl window sign for Great Works Employment Service, located at 7020 Bidoff Road, permanent parcel number 432-28001, docket 11-2017-1. Uh, under old business, there's a request from Matthew L. Weber for preliminary site plan for a four-story, 85-room hotel on Teton Road, permanent parcel number 433-09018 and 433-09017, docket 5-2017-3. A request from Matthew L. Weber for conditional use for a four-story uh, hotel on Tiedemann Road, permanent parcel number 433-09018 and 433-09017, docket number 5-2017-4. And finally, a request from Matthew L. Weber for lot consolidation approval at Tiedemann Road, permanent parcel number 433-09018 and 433-09017, docket number 5-2017-5. I would uh, like to mention that all individuals are welcome to attend the meeting, and you have the right to come either in person uh, or in writing. And that's all I have. Next up is our school board liaison, Councilman Politsky. Thank you, Mr. Van Kirk. Uh, since our uh, resident, uh, Meg Ryan Shockey, mentioned most of the school board <coughs> meeting, I would just add a few things that she didn't. First of all, there is a hotline that the children can call 24-7, and that number is 1-866-547-836-263. Today I got a, an email from Dr. Glykoff, and I would like to read it. And he said, thanks for attending the BOE meeting last Tuesday. In terms of your update, Pete, please feel free to share whatever you deem appropriate. Certainly, we have had several parents who came to express concerns about alleged bullying. I would ask that you also report in your report that I have invited all of these parents who spoke or attended BOE meeting last Tuesday to a special district climate task force meeting scheduled for next Monday night. I believe it's 5.30. We wanted to provide some more detail to our district work and gain some valuable feedback from those parents who took the time to attend our board meeting last week. It should help us to pinpoint our efforts across the district even better. And that ends my report. Thank you, Ms. Plitsky. The Finance Committee did meet this evening at 6.30 just prior to um, the council meeting. Uh, we dealt with Resolution 2016-5, declaring City Council's intent to vacate a portion of Montgomery Place south of Manoa Avenue and requiring notice to be published and declaring the emergency. Uh, this has been um, on our agenda in advance for quite some time since the middle part of 2016, and uh, Mr. Butler uh, gave an explanation of that, and he will do so uh, for the uh, public when he gives his report at the end, uh, later on in our meeting. Uh, next up was Ordinance 2017-74 is up for a third reading and adoption. This is amending Ordinance 2017-2, authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Cost Recovery Corporation, LLC, for billing and related services attributed to fire department incidents. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous meeting, this ordinance allows for the collection of fees based upon equipment and manpower used at the scene of services provided by the city. Uh, this, we already have an ordinance on the books that does this, but this ordinance uh, provides more details uh, that was requested by one of the insurance companies uh, here in the city. And the uh, committee did vote uh, to um, recommend council adopt. Uh, resolution 2017-11 is on second reading, authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with the District Board of Health of Cuyahoga County for health services for the year 2018. Uh, this is required by the Ohio Revised Code. It stipulates that uh, every city must provide health services either through a city health district or by contract with the county health district. Uh, to, remain a certified, to remain certified, council must approve this resolution. The cost will be the same as it was last year. It's, the per capita rate is $4.12, and this resolution authorizes two payments of $23,008 that will be, be made semi-annually. Ordinance 2017-75 is up for second reading. This is the amended annual appropriations. Uh, Mr. Schaefer gave a detailed report about the amendments to the appropriations at the last meeting. I will just give a very uh, brief summary. Uh, this ordinance adds an additional $205,852 to the general ex fund expenses for 2017. Most of that is for additional wages. The total effect to all appropriation adjustments is $2,429,659. This number includes a little over $205,000 for the general fund, um, excuse me, for the team and road project, as well as additional funds for the road on road project 
of $1.8 million. And so you've got the 205 582 from the general fund, the $1.8 million, the Road on Road Project, the $291,000 from Tiedemann Road Project for a total of $2.4 million. And that's on second reading. Ordinance 2017-76 is on second reading, authorizing the mayor to enter into job retention and creation grant with HMI Industries Incorporated. Uh, this agreement is based upon the agreement that HMI has with the city to bring an estimated $3 million annual payroll. And they're considering um, leasing a portion of the former AG facility. And uh, they, they plan on investing about $310,000 in new machinery, equipment, and inventory. And they plan on commencing January 1st of this next year. As soon as uh, they get into the facility, they'll bring 60 full-time jobs. And the grant will be for 30% of total income taxes paid to the city in year one, 20% in year two. <coughs> On first reading this evening is resolution 2017-13. This is requesting the county fiscal officer to advance tax proceeds of the 2017 tax levies pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code, section 321.34. Um, this has to do with how we receive our taxes after they're collected from the county. Um, if Mr. Schaefer wants to elaborate more on his report, he can certainly do so. Then Ordinance 2017-77 is on first reading. This amends Section 182.02 of Chapter 182, Income Tax, effective January 1, 2016, of the codified ordinance of the City of Brooklyn. Uh, this is a housekeeping ordinance uh, that we came across with some of the dealings in the Finance Department. And again, Mr. Schaefer will address that uh, when he gives his re finance report a little bit later on this evening. That is all for committees, commissions, and boards. We will now move on with our reports of council. We begin this evening with Mrs. Balbeer. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say congratulations to Mr. Hennings. Uh, just when I met some new people in the city that had some sort of tree fungus, he no longer is working for the city, so I can't ask him. So we'll have to see what happens there. Uh, I'd also like to say congratulations to our Brooklyn residents, Diane and Dennis Esper. They are the proud grandparents of Zach Lowther, who was drafted in the second round out of Xavier University. He was signed by the Baltimore Orioles. He is a big left-handed pitcher. Congratulations. Wouldn't that be wonderful if somebody made it to the major leagues you know, from Brooklyn? That would be great. I'd also like to thank the Brooklyn Acres for having a fantastic Halloween party for all the kids there in the area. It was just amazing. It was a beautiful day. They had what was called trunk or treat. And all the cars would back up behind the, uh, um, the center there and uh, the community center and open the car, open their trunks. Every, they were all decorated and they had candy for the kids. The kids stayed in hot inside, played musical chairs, had hot dogs and just had their costumes on the time of their life. It was fabulous. But being in the restaurant business and catering and parties, I know what it takes to set up, to clean up, and to cook. God bless those women that made it so nice for those kids. And when those kids come, they have the biggest smiles on their face. So it was a great community get together. You did a great job. You know, when I go door to door and I listen to residents, I always like to talk about, well, how do you like the services here? Overwhelmingly, they love the police, but they love the fire department better. And I had one, one gentleman, and I think it's because of the EMS. It's not because of you, Chief. No. <laughs> but anyways, I do love it. Um, I had one gentleman say, if it wasn't for our EMS and our fire, I would not be here. And so I just thought, you know, I, it made me feel so good. So, um, and I know this gentleman, he just, just sat there and praised and praised. He was an amputee and a, a very sickly man, but he was just so, so excited about our EMS and couldn't say enough great things. And I, told, of course, totally agreed. Um, I do have a question for our law director. I know there's a, um, there's a, there are amendments uh, on the ballots, and I would just like if, Kevin, if our law director, Kevin Butler, and all his expertise would explain um, the amendment to the charter concerning the zoning in the simplest terms in the simplest simplest terms and um, and what is the purpose for this amendment yeah. could you kindly do that sure 
Mrs. Dobrikin, can you do his report? Oh yeah, that would be fine. Thank that you. would be fine. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but you Thank know, you, we came in late and stuff. Uh, also, I want to put out there, remember to vote, November 7th, issue 58. you got to remember, strong schools, strong cities. Um, also, I just wanted to make a comment. Since the very start of the United States of America, we have lived in the freest nation in history. Our laws are based on the Constitution. There are many amendments, but none more important than the First Amendment involving the right to freedom of speech. The right of citizens to express their pleasure or their displeasure with anything or anyone involved in their government is protected. All of us sitting up here, and that includes me, have to realize that every citizen has the right to disagree and criticize any actions we take up here individually or collectively. <coughs> Mr. Foradorio, to address some of your, um, your uh, comments, you seem like a very kind and gentle man, a very nice man. But I would have to beg to differ, and I believe Mayor Balbeer would also differ with, the, with his letter and Mr. Van Kirk's letter. I, I truly would believe that they would, they're their worlds apart. And let me remind everyone here, that issue three was not lies, just to show it was defeated by two to one. So that tells you something. And that pretty much concludes my report. Next up is Mr. Tansky. <coughs> well, I had a seven page report. But after these speakers that came to this podium, they have grabbed my heart in a way that I'm putting to bed this back and forth stuff today. But when on last week, what I heard from the residents, that they do not want to see that ever again. They want the business of the city to move on to make the city a great city. So I'm going to read some of the uh, report that I have, but <coughs> my heart has got to me more than these tactics and politics. And my union background would say, read their report because what they did to you was wrong. Was wrong. The day I was supposed to be at that candidate's night, I couldn't because of my mother. <coughs> and I couldn't do it. Otherwise, I would have been there. So I'm not going to make anything personally against anybody. Mr. Herbert, like you said the same thing. But there are some things in this report <coughs> that I do want to talk about. As far as the signs that have been an issue that keep coming up, I will tell you this. If there is any sign that doesn't belong anywhere, I will personally pull that sign out. It's not done intentionally. It's not done against anybody. I will pull that sign out. Maybe I misplaced it. I, I, maybe I read an address wrong. I've gotten calls from other signs that shouldn't be in there. They can remove it. That resident can remove it. They have that right. In a day and age where bullying seems to be such a troubling problem in our school and society, I, frequ I frequently tell my son, you are as good as the company you keep. I am proud of the people in the city that support me and will continue to take that high road. Mr. Herbix asked for a records request, all records of the solar farm that's being placed in our city landfill that will generate this city revenue. I wish you would have read some of the 
emails or even the letter or paragraph that was sent to me by the Director of Sustainability, Mike Fuller. It's positive, so I'm going to read something that's very positive. Kevin, in some previous emails, I forwarded you correspondence between yourself and myself relating to the Brooklyn Landfill Solar Project. I want to reiterate how thrilled we are with this project and the great assistance you gave in talking to me about the site and pushing me to have it analyzed the location for our landfill and solar project. When we started talking about this possible concept of putting solar panels on landfills and generating electricity into our facilities, I was still fairly new to the county sustainability director and I'm unfamiliar with issues surrounding landfill solar projects. We had an interest from a developer in our in testing the theory of landfill solar, but didn't have great sites. You raised the Brooklyn landfill site to me and stated it would be a great place <coughs> to put lots of solar panels on. It became, it became clear pretty quickly that you were right and this site was perfect for this project as it had great space, was close to CPP infrastructure, and through this project could help Brooklyn achieve electric distribution competition, which is a complete <coughs> rarity in this country. Thanks for all your help in it initiating the idea of the site and helping shepherd us together with Mayor Gallagher through the Brooklyn governmental structure. So I'm going to put my seven page report on what happened last week and I'm going to keep everything positive through the rest of this campaign and if anybody has any questions that anything that was said at the door, either by myself or Ken, feel free to call me. I'm not going to go out and campaign and say the wrong things. If there's something that somebody misinterpreted the wrong way, I'm not going to clear it up. I make mistakes. Everybody here up makes mistakes. Any candidate running for office makes mistakes, either on their figures or what they might be campaigning on. So with that. Close my report. Thank you, Mr. Tansky. Next up is Mrs. Politsky. Thank you, Mr. Van Kirk. First, I'd like to apologize for my asthma and my cough, so please bear with me. This coming January, I will be 80 years old. So I have a little life experience behind me. I decided to run for city council to be a voice for the seniors in our community. I started my time on council having to choose a council appointment to fill the mayor's seat. Debbie was not my first choice to fill this vacancy. It was not because I had anything against her. I didn't really even know her. But I felt that if she wanted the job, she should have run and campaigned like the rest of us. Council was very divided on this appointment choice and instead of continuing to fight, I compromised and changed my vote and voted for her. Much to my surprise, when it came time for the next big decision, that of council president, others were unwilling to compromise. I stand by my vote to keep Ron Van Kirk as council president. I only say this now to highlight that compromise and working through problems should not rest on one or two people. This is a group effort. We are your elected council and here to represent you and act as a check and balance to the mayor. We should not be putting our personal agendas before any voter. As for Mayor Gallagher, she was not my first choice for mayor either. My next door neighbor was Mary Lee Bowen. But just because she wasn't my first choice doesn't mean I wasn't going to give her a chance to do her job. She was left with a lot of problems to deal with and has been working hard to resolve them. Anytime I have gone to her with an idea for a project or event for the residents of this community, she has helped me. Now, because I work with the mayor to get things done in our city, I, along with Kevin Tansky and Ron Van Kirk, have been labeled as mayor's people. If working with the administration to get things done for the residents of our community makes me a mayor's person, then I will gladly accept that title. But I think our residents are smart enough to read through this rhetoric. 
I'm going to leave you with some thoughts from a lady who has been around the Brooklyn block more than a few times since 1971. The longer people out there and up here on council keep tearing things down, the longer and harder it will be for them to build it back up. It's your choice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flitsky. Next up is Mr. DeMarco. Um, my report is only three pages, so um, but I'm going to keep it short tonight. Um, I want to thank everyone that came up and spoke this evening. And a couple of words that I jotted down here are civility and trust that I thought was kind of a, an underlying theme through everyone's comments. And um, what I can say to you is in my eight years on, on council, um, especially more recently, um, personally my trust has been violated many times. And I, I had a list of examples tonight, but I'm not going to run through those. Um, and as for the election, um, it, you know, and unfortunately it's political season. I would just uh, ask your support for the re-election of Ms. Pucci, Ms. Tomasco, and Ms. Balbir. Um, we've disagreed many times on a variety of issues, but I appreciate their thoughtfulness, their, their time in researching a topic, and then speaking their opinion, their opinion, even if it's different than mine. And I frankly think that that is the main role of a council member is to have an independent voice to think for yourself and at the end of the day vote your opinion after you've talked to the residents and research whatever the particular issue is and so i would ask your support for these three council members and i'd also ask you to give the opportunity to steve herbig who did a great job on issue three i think he even uncovered some facts that were not uh, given to the residents on the front end and although uh, development is needed in the city I mean, at that time, in that particular way, it was not the right process. So uh, I encourage everyone to get out and vote. This is an extremely uh, important election for the future of Brooklyn. And uh, I think, as Mr. Forredower said, we've, we've got a great city with a great group of residents. And I'm confident that the residents will do the right thing on Election Day. And that's all I have. Next up is Mr. Musco. Yes, good evening. Um, you know, I'm an engineer, and um, I guess maybe because my undergrad's in engineering, I like data. I like to deal with facts. Um, so first off, I appreciated Mr. Mr. Prochko, I apologize, coming up and giving us the data. That's the best way to go about an argument, is to have data. And he talked about us not draining the pool since 2007 and a lot of chemicals in the pool. I, I have to add on to that. A girlfriend of mine takes the water aerobics class and she recounted to me about two weeks ago that their swimsuits literally discolored and almost disintegrated based on the amount of chemicals in the pool. So I guess I would ask the rec board and our um, recreation manager to take a serious look at the chemical situation um, in the pool because if you've got people that their um, swimsuits discolor and start to fall apart, that clearly uh, signals something is wrong. But again, I want to stick on facts, and that's, that's how I try to be, is very data-driven and factual-driven. One thing I want to start out with clarifying in terms of facts is so much has been said um, from people this evening, from other council members, from the mayor last week and several times before, implying that we're not working for the citizens of the city. We're not getting things done. We're not going about the business of the city because there's this conflict on council with people disagreeing with each other. I just want to set that record straight. We are doing the business of the city. Things are getting passed. Budgets are being done. Legislation is being passed. There's nothing that is not happening because some of us disagree. If anything, I would argue things are happening better because there's open debate in meetings about why are we spending this, what are the priorities, etc. So work is clearly getting done, this whole thing that nothing's happening. And I would challenge the mayor to give me one piece of legislation that she has pushed forward or would like support on that we have not supported. And I would challenge her to do that because I'd really like to know what we're not doing and supporting legislation-wise that she thinks needs to happen. Um, the only thing I can think of legislation-wise was issue three. 
and that the voters came across loud and clear. But I really want to clear up this misconception that work is not being done. Um, and we're not getting things done. We most definitely are getting things done. And if people want to come to the finance meeting prior to this meeting, if they want to come to the various subcommittee meetings, you'll see work is getting done and things are being passed. Um, so I did want to comment on that. I, I do have to comment on one other thing that the mayor said last week. Um, she commented that you know she's available all the time and she's there and she you know does a coffee every now and then. I did attend the last couple of coffees that she's done because you know I like to hear the questions. It's a good opportunity to hear residents' questions. Um, the mayor also said she has a couple of community meetings every now and then, and um, she said you know those are very well attended. Well, unfortunately, one of my girlfriends called me. The last community meeting that the mayor had was on Sunday, September 17th at Shady Lane, which actually was the house of our uh, service director. And it was a community meeting with the mayor and members of her staff. The only problem is the only council people that apparently knew about this meeting were some of the council people that the mayor supports. I didn't know anything about the meeting. Councilwoman Pusey didn't know anything about the meeting. Ms. Belver and Mr. Marco didn't know anything about the meeting. So I guess I'm saying in the future, I appreciate being invited to community meetings so that I can go and listen to what the residents have to say. And this is the invitation of this that my girlfriend sent and she actually attended the meeting. Um, one other thing I wanted to comment on is, you know, a lot of people tonight have said, well, that letter that Mr. Van Kirk sent out was, you know, no big deal. It really was no big deal. And then reading the letter at a public meeting was really no big deal. Um, I commented on it because I felt it was a big deal. And again, going back to facts and actual data, I contacted the Ohio Attorney General's office. They kind of thought it was a big deal to be reading campaign literature at a public council meeting. I have another call scheduled with them because they're interested in following up on that discussion. So I just wanted to share that with you. Once again, facts, data. Um, I wanted to also talk about the upcoming election. Um, there has been a lot of craziness. I, for one, will be very happy when this election is over. My family will see me once again. My dog will be very happy to see me once again. I've been walking around campaigning with a broken toe. So I will be very happy to put my foot up. The thing I'm asking everybody to do, please, is do your research. Do it based on facts. And I'm going to comment on uh, Brooklyn Acres did host a community event, a candidate night, where all of the candidates, uh, excuse me, the majority of candidates were there. We all answered the same question. Uh, Mark Cullen moderated it. Each one was given the question. We all answered the same question. We were civil to each other. There were no insults. There were no disagreements. But you can clearly see how we stand on each of the issues. So please, focus on facts, focus on issues. Look beyond the political rhetoric. Look beyond what everybody's campaign, campaign material says. <coughs> Listen to the issues and the facts. And they videotape that session, and it's going to be available on YouTube, uh, I think under Brooklyn Acres Candidate Session or something. So I wanted to comment on that. Um, before we have our next meeting, very quickly, I want to wish everybody a happy Halloween. I hope all the kids go out and are safe. I know our Brooklyn police always do an outstanding job of uh, watching. And I really hope people do give out candy because it is so cute to see the kids. I also participated in the Brooklyn Acres and it was so cute uh, to see the kids all dressed up. So please be safe on Halloween. Another incredibly important holiday that's going to be happening before the next meeting is Veterans Day. Um, you know, all of us in politics like to call ourselves public servants. They're the public servants. Those people who literally give their lives for our country. Excuse me, I get very emotional about this because I have a nephew in the service and who um, gave us the right to vote. So again, on behalf of the veterans and on behalf of this wonderful country, make sure you vote on November 7th. That would be most appreciated and it's, it's really what they're fighting and dying for. So with that, thank you very much. Good evening. Next up is Mrs. Pucci. Thank you. Good evening. 
Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate Bobby Hennings on his retirement. Um, I've known Bobby since before he worked for the city. Uh, his father, Nelson, did work on the fire department with my father-in-law, and uh, I do appreciate that he mentioned my father-in-law who helped him get the job with the city. Um, I wish him all the best. Um, he's one of our hardest workers. I mean, all of our employees are great, but um, Bobby has a, a true sense of dedication to the city and the community, and I think um, we all appreciate that. I would also like to thank Brooklyn Acres for the invite to the Halloween event. I know that they have a wonderful uh, social events committee. And afterwards, I went to see my mom, and I was later than I would normally get there on a Sunday. And she, you know, I told her where I was. And I have no idea if there's anybody my mom's age who was raised in the Acres still around. But um, one of her comments was that the Acres have always done a really great job uh, having events for young people and families. And she just mentioned two from back in her day. One was the BR Canteen, and the B stood for Brooklyn, and the R stood for Rhodes. And then also uh, Junior Olympics that they always had that she participated in. So they have a very nice long tradition of uh, promoting family events. Um, I have a Safe Routes to School report. Um, we did kick off the Fall Fest with the 5K Walk and Run. It was very nice to see all the families who were participating. We do not charge anything for this because we want everyone who'd like to be able to participate to be involved in that. Um, thank you also to the planners and volunteers who had a part in Fall Fest. It was a really beautiful day. Um, on Wednesday, October 4th, Safe Rods to School had the National Walk to School Day. And I usually walk with the group that comes from the streets east of Ridge. And the theme was uh, Walk with a Hero. And we had our police officers and firefighters and Chief Zemeck participated also. I'd like to um, just thank all of our safety forces. Um, I don't want to tell you that the kids were just so thrilled and excited to be able to walk to school with our officers. And they were absolutely great with the kids. Um, we did a walkability audit uh, last Monday, October 16th, and I was partnered with Sergeant Knapp, so uh, I really benefited from his experience and expertise. This is uh, one of the steps that I had previously reported on in preparing to apply for the infrastructure grant from ODOT, which will help us uh, secure funds to enhance the uh, safety of our students walking to school. Uh, later, uh, um, I also attended the Coffee with a Cop, and I'd like to thank Dunkin' Donuts for hosting and also the officers who participated. Um, when I was talking to the officers who were there, I asked them, I said, is there anything you either think the residents don't know or wish they knew about your job? And what they came up with were two things. The first was that there was a lot more going on in our city that they deal with than the average resident knows. And the second was, if something seems out of place or gives you cause for concern, not only to call, but to call right away. They said that many times residents either don't call or sometimes after thinking about it for a while they call, but a lot of times that's a little bit too late for them to have the necessary information or, or track down the leads they need. So I know that uh, Chief Moki says this very frequently. If you see something, say something. If there's any thought in your mind at all, call. They're more than happy to check it out, even if it turns out to be nothing, because if it does turn out to be something, they really depend on residents for that information. Um, just a reminder that the Safety Committee is going to schedule a visit to the Regional Dispatch Center. I'm going to check with the Chief, so um, then I'll send out an email to see what dates work best for Mrs. Valbeer and uh, Mrs. Politsky. I also attended the Oktoberfest at the Senior Center, and I'd like to thank Karen, Kathy, and all the volunteers. It was a lovely afternoon. We did have our budget meeting on October 16th, and I'd like to thank Mr. Schaefer and Mrs. Hay for all the preparation. I think we're almost there. We started last, uh, the, I guess, was it May? Yeah, preparing for our 2018 budget. So we're in the home stretch. 
Um, just a couple, I'm going to try and avoid redundancies and things that I can handle with directors by email. Um, I did have a resident mention to me that in the co at the coffee with the mayor that, uh, Mayor, you mentioned that we're going to do the shredding next year. Um, so I'm glad to see that that's coming back. Um, I know in uh, 2016 we weren't able to make that happen, but when we did the Beautify Brooklyn uh, events, that was actually one of the most popular things was the shredding for our residents, and I know that residents have been asking for it. And um, just a reminder that we were able to get a grant for that. Um, Mr. Burba, I don't know if you're going to be helping work on this again or not, but just a reminder that grant did pay for it. And I know that um, a lot of communities are getting them to pay for them twice a year now also. Um, I'm glad that Mr. Butler is going to um, talk about the charter amendments. As I go door to door, I've been getting questions, and really mostly it's cleaning up language. But just a little heads up on what some of the questions are. There's a little concern with the zoning language, and would that have an impact on things not going on the ballot? That should go on the ballot now, and my answer to them is no, but if you could explain that, there is some confusion out there about that, so that would be appreciated. Um, regarding the bullying, I, I know that this has come up in the past and I had um, brought it to the attention of Chief Milky because we do have a school resource officer in the um, city and I've spoken to a couple board members and obviously nobody condones bullying, but they do have a system set up and it's very important that parents uh, follow the, the system and the process that they have because this is really in place because the school board wants to be able to know what are the complaints coming in and how they get resolved. Now by law, there's a lot of things that can't be divulged to the public because of privacy issues with students. But I know that uh, the school board is taking a look at this as well as the administrators and they've stressed the importance of following the process, the process that they've set up, which is new this year, so that they can basically close the loop and that and that so that the school board is aware of how they're getting resolved. Um, just for a point of information, um, over the years I've been involved in a lot of neighborhood issues that involve trees and shrubs, um, basically overgrowing, encroaching on neighbors' property. And sometimes we're not able to resolve this ideally, which would be that the owner of the trees and shrubs would actually take care of it and take responsibility. And this has really over the years been a source of frustration for neighbors. Um, I had several conversations with Mr. Butler about what possible solutions, and um, he sent me some information what Lakewood does. I checked into a couple of other cities and asked him to draft an ordinance just to see what it would look like that could possibly help us address these situations. I know that it's not going to be the answer to all the problems because basically it would have to become either a safety issue or a public nuisance issue, but um, as soon as I get that draft, I'll share it with the rest of council. And I, I wasn't at the last meeting. In fact, um, we did have a medical issue in my family that was pretty serious, and I do want to thank the residents and my colleagues who reached out for, to me on that. Um, I did not receive the letter, um, but I did have a resident bring it to my, my attention, and their concern was that it said Brooklyn City Council. Now, my personal opinion is that it, it is a little deceptive because when you see something at the top of um, like a letterhead that is from a group that it does give the impression. I recognize that it's not illegal. I recognize that, you know, it's not unethical, but I did have a resident bring it to my attention. Um, I would like to echo what Ms. Tomasco said without being repetitive, and that is that there is nothing that has been proposed that hasn't passed. I mentioned at a council meeting in September that I would say at least 95% of the issues, we're all on the same page and it's all unanimous. And I think everybody up here is working for the betterment of our city. And yes, you know, are we always on the same page? No, but that's okay. 
Um, I like what the speaker said about civility. Um, I always try and conduct myself in that manner, and I think that is very important for everyone to be civil when you're in disagreement. But um, that was a concern of mine. And um, another thing, that we, and I didn't know you were going to mention about the neighborhood meeting. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, I would like to ask the mayor for her assurance that you are going to let us know when there's neighborhood meetings. Um, I Personally, how I found out about it was I had a resident who said, hey, you know, you weren't at the neighborhood meeting. It must have been something pretty important since that was my old neighborhood. And, um, you know, something else I had important to do. So, you know, I'm not sure how some council people found out about it and others, but I think it's wrong. And I think we're all entitled to know when there's a neighborhood meeting. Um, issue 58, Mr. Blown did a great job of explaining all the facts. So I would ask residents to please consider supporting it. It is very important. And uh, Mr. Butler, um, I just want to double check with you, and I don't need an answer right now. We can wait till it's on the agenda. But before you came to finance, I did ask if we had amended 2017-75. And I, I was told yes, but it's just not reflected in the minutes. So I just want to make sure before we complete our second reading, this is the job creation 76. grant. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Um, the job creation grant, I just want to make sure it was amended before we go on um, and complete the second reading. And thank you to everyone who spoke. We appreciate it. I wish that we had this many people at all of our council meetings. Um, as Ms. Tomasco has mentioned quite frequently, um, we need to hear from you. We're elected by you, and we need to hear what your thoughts and views are on what's going on in the city. And that completes my report. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to add to Ms. Pucci's uh, safety report. I didn't think about it until you mentioned the safety report. On Sunday, I take uh, a, a good friend that I've known for years <clears throat> to church, and she lives on Southwood. And she insisted I come in the house and listen to a message that she got on her phone. And it wasn't from the IRS, it was from someone else that threatened her if she didn't call them back and send them some money that she was going to be arrested and if she didn't do it immediately, there would be someone at her house. And she's 80 years old too, so I think they're targeting older people, so keep that in mind. And that's the end of my report. And may I be recommended just briefly? Um, Ms. Polsky reminded me of something that she said, um, talking about compromise. Um, compromise is always important, but um, I was the one who changed my vote and compromised um, when Mr. Selchertz was appointed. So um, I think there is, you know, on most issues, I think there is um, a willingness to compromise. But yes, that is important, and um, I think that. Uh, I'm sorry, but I lost my train of thought. But um, compromise is important, and um, I, I think in general, we do a pretty good job of compromising on issues for the betterment of the city. Thank you. Excuse me, may I just make a quick one? Yes. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to just comment briefly about the uh, my being appointed a council, et cetera, that Ms. Kalitsky made. Um, I, I had run for council quite a few years ago, and. Um, I had to suspend my campaign in early October because my uh, our favorite aunt passed away. And uh, nieces and nephews were the ones who handled the estate. But anyway, when the votes came in, I unfortunately did not win, but I came in next. And I had something like 850 votes, which I was very happy about. Um, Mr. Selchurch, who was one of my opponents, <coughs> had about 400 votes, so less than half the number of votes that I garnered. And yet, when it came time to appoint somebody to city council, Mr. Selchurch was appointed. And I was kind of puzzled because I thought, well, so much for the will of the people. You would think that the next, the person that had the next highest number of votes would have been appointed, and that would have been me. But that's not what happened. So I just kind of wanted to clear up a little bit about um, being appointed and running for council and, and how people do get appointed here in Brooklyn. Thank you. Well, one of and about the only uh, benefits of election season is another chance for to walk the streets of Brooklyn and talk to residents. Um, 
All of us live extremely busy lives. Mr. Ford hit on that just a second ago. But it is great to see that the love and passion that many residents have in our city. Uh, I will echo what Mrs. Pucci said. I would love to see this number of residents at every council meeting. Uh, over the past several weeks, I've had the privilege of talking to many residents at their doors, on the phone or through email. A common thread runs through each and every conversation. They love our town. They're passionate about keeping Brooklyn great. And most of all, they're thrilled with the positive things that are going on here. Just this past Saturday, I spoke with a dear man who lost his wife last year after a long bout with cancer. He and his wife enjoyed many years of winter trips to Florida in their RV, and the peace of mind they felt leaving their home in Brooklyn knowing it would be safe while they were away. That peace of mind came courtesy of our safety forces, and aware neighbors allowed them to enjoy their time together in peace. He informed me he's getting ready to take another southern trip this year, although it will be without his wife, sadly, but he truly was an inspiration. After our last council meeting, I got a phone call from a resident, 83-year-old lady who has lived in Brooklyn for many years. I've never met her before. Her phrase to me was, keep on keeping on. She loves the fact that we have new businesses coming into our town and the positive challenges and changes that they will bring. She watched the last council meeting and kind of told me with a half smile, a laugh, quote, you must be doing something right to have that much passion against you. Again, that was an encouragement. I run into residents who love the new sound walls that just went up along I-480 and the much quieter environments that provides their property. Another insightful resident asked about the city's short-term plan to cope the loss of the AG revenue. I was able to explain to them how council, along with this administration and previous administrations, saw that need, and we had prepared for that shortfall, and we were able to build up large reserves in our general fund. This is now acting as a cushion to our city as we bring in more businesses to replace those that we've lost. I spoke with many older residents who were thrilled about the new senior, listed, senior assisted living home currently under construction behind Ridge Park Square. Many are struggling more and more, unfortunately, each day just to stay in their home and take care of them. And they're thrilled with the prospect that leaving their house does not mean they have to leave Brooklyn. I spoke with another resident who just moved to Brooklyn within the last year or so who lived in Cleveland. She had glowing remarks about our safety forces and the public services. Then on the other hand, I've also heard some things from residents that are actually totally false. One resident said that he was told by his neighbor that the city is going to be building houses in Marquardt Park. I assume this idea comes because of a passing comment that was taken out of context, made in one council work session and mentioned on council floor as just an idea that was thrown out at a work session. Thankfully, this resident that heard that knew better and corrected their neighbor. People looking out for each other. That's another great feature of our city. Just in case you were wondering, there is no construction of Marquardt Park, nor are there any plans for such. I spoke with another resident whose street was under construction a year or two ago, much like those that are experiencing a road on right now. And she could not be happier with the new roads, aprons, and sidewalks. She lived in a city prior to coming to Brooklyn that put very little money into street maintenance, and street conditions bore that out. While inconvenient while under construction, she was thrilled with the finished product. She encouraged council administration to keep working the street maintenance program. As you can tell, much of what I heard from the residents has been positive. Beyond the positive, positives, without exception, all would like to see more things accomplished for our town, and to that I could not agree more. This is what makes Brooklyn great. People seeking a better life in a better city. This has been accomplished with truthful, open dialogue. Disagreements, yes, and compromises. Because I said, as I said earlier in this meeting, there is much more that unites us than divides us. A loud rhetoric may temporarily make people feel better, but it rarely accomplishes anything of substance. We have so many things going for us in this town. We have wonderful, caring people. We've got a major corporation getting ready to uh, start uh, renovations on the AG property and moving in the next year or so. We've got an assisted living center that we've been working on for over 20 years finally going up. We've got a first of its kind solar panel uh, being built on our old city dump that will bring in revenue to the city. We've got major road repairs like those that are going on a road um, with more roads to come next year. And this list could go on and on. There are many bright days ahead. And I very much look forward to seeing positive, encouraging things happening in our town. Here's the bottom line. Each of us have our own thoughts, we have our own opinions, and we have our own candidates that we feel will better serve Brooklyn. I know, as was mentioned tonight, I certainly have a lot to still work on in my life, as we all do. However, at the end of the day, we are all Brooklyn residents and have the best interests of our town at heart. Many of us have campaigned and will continue to campaign over these coming weeks for those opinions and for those candidates. Brooklyn will then decide who it is that is best to lead our city in the future. Anyone can tear down. It takes real courage to build up. I will end with this quote from one of America's finest statesmen when Thomas Jefferson once said this, I like the dreams of the future 
better than the history of the past. And I totally agree. Whatever it is that you decide for, please remember to vote on November 7th of 2017 and Brooklyn, make Brooklyn a better place. That is all I have. I'm now going the mayor's report. Mayor. Thank you, Council President Van Kirk. The Mayors and Managers Association met with Destination Cleveland CEO Dave Gilbert on October 11th to hear about some projects and initiatives going on in the Cleveland region. There's some exciting things happening here, and I can't wait to see some of them happen. But what I want to elaborate on is Mr. Gilbert talked extensively about how Cleveland did not see an uptake in, uptick in tourism until locals started to think and speak positively about Cleveland and their local communities. Cleveland has for several years beat the national average in tourism numbers. And if you're interested in being a part of these new activities that are coming to Cleveland or being a volunteer at these events, they are taking volunteers. You can go right on the Destination Cleveland website to sign up. Um, so I just want to kind of reiterate, you know, positivity creates people coming to your city. And, you know, we, if you go onto Facebook, you go into different sites, you know, one thing I, I, I mentioned at the last meeting, when we're talking positive about our community, people want to come here. People want to buy houses. People want to look at different things. And this will increase our revenue. It will make our property values go up. So that's one of the, my takeaways from this in Destination Cleveland. I also want to thank Karen Prado, Kathy Masari, and the Senior Center volunteers who helped make Oktoberfest at the Senior Center a success this year. It was a wonderful event, as always. I want to thank all the council members and residents who attended last week's budget meeting. I think there was some productive conversations in the room, so I appreciate the feedback by all the council members that were there. Thank you to the Girl Scout troops that came to visit me last Wednesday night here at City Hall. I was able to give them a tour, bring them into the mayor's office. They were very excited to ask different questions about government, uh, my job, city council's job, and the community. Uh, these girls were ranging in various ages and they asked terrific questions. Um, it's just such a good organization for girls um, growing up in this community. Uh, the Employee Wellness Committee put together a, another great wellness fair last Thursday here at City Hall. All the employees had a chance to get free flu shots, receive multiple tests, know their health numbers. Uh, I want to thank all the local businesses that participated, including Parma University Hospitals who did all the testing for free. I want to thank Therapeutic Touch who came, Hudak Dental, Medical Mutual, Lifestyle EAP, Gold's Gym, GNC, Soza Fitness and Wellness, U.S. Swai Chow Kung Fu Academy, Brooklyn Recreation Center, and the Cleveland Lunch Fix. Um, the employees over the last two years as I've been mayor have been really kind of embracing all these different health challenges we've been putting in for them. And this really has helped to keep our health, our, our claim rates down. So uh, this helps keep our, our expenses down in City Hall. So I just want to thank the employees um, for participating and, and um, doing some of these events here in the city. Uh, last Thursday, I also took part in the First Suburbs Consortium meeting where each community was provided the most recent property tax delinquencies. I passed this out in the Finance Committee to all city council members. The city of Brooklyn has approximately $227,000 in residential tax property delinquencies so far for tax year 2016. The total outstanding property tax delinquencies for both commercial and residential pro properties is approximately $1,018,000. And as many of you know, the schools receive the bulk of the percentage uh, for the property taxes. This is really where they uh, pay their expenses from. Um, so this, when people aren't paying these property taxes, it really does have an adverse financial impact for them. Uh, the city's portion of the property taxes is only 6.1%, um, so it's a smaller hit for us as well. As part of the hardest hit funds, the county prosecutor's office and the county land bank have hired a bunch more employees and they will be helping cities to be more aggressive on some of these owners who are just sitting on the land and not paying their ta taxes, especially certain commercial properties throughout the region. I wanted to answer a couple of resident questions. Uh, Mr. Ardito, uh, thank you for your feedback. Uh, as most of you know, what, how the city decides on the street repair program is the engineer does a ranking of all the streets, um, and then we make a decision based upon how much money we have. This year, we are putting Torrance, Orchard, and the rest of Delora on the list. I um, 
I know that South Amber's high. Uh, there's a couple other streets that really need a repair, uh, such as Pelham, that one comes to mind. Uh, so we just have to tackle them as we go. How much money? We typically put about $1 million towards streets. This particular year with the Rhode Island project, that was about $2.3 million. Uh, so we did significantly more this past year than we had in the past, and that was only, we were only able to accomplish the one street in the alleyway with that money. Um, so we're continuing to work on that. Um, we will continue to put a lot of money towards our streets, and so hopefully South Amber will be on the list in the near future, but I can't promise you the date. Um, you did question uh, the hotel. Uh, that particular area is called a, a limited industrial area. So what happened over the years as the planning commissions from the past uh, did particular passages of uh, conditional uses such as Key Bank, an office building, or Hampton Inn across the street, uh, same zoning uh, code use. What they did is kind of, kind of open the door for different things to go in there. That's private property right there. Key owns that property. Um, so unless there's something in our codified ordinances or the Ohio Revised Code that allows us to deviate from that conditional use, uh, there's uh, really limited discretion on what we can do. So um, I like the idea of where you're going with office buildings. Sometimes we don't have a choice because of based upon past choices from previous administrations and planning commission meetings. Um, I hope that answers your question. It's kind of complicated. I, um, I, I felt that when we were talking about issue three and the zoning changes, it's very difficult sometimes to explain zoning from the ground up when uh, a lot of people don't really have a background in it. Um, so if you have any other questions, just come see me. Uh, Mr. Pochko, I appreciate your comments tonight. Um, you know that I am a frequent visitor of the Recreation Center. I do get in the pool. I have my daughter's swim classes. I know, I think Ms. Polinski is really the only other person up here that uses the, um, the pool frequently. So um, I agree with you. There's a, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done with the Recreation Center. Um, I have been working on some um, neat concepts going forward. Uh, and to be perfectly candid, I'm waiting until after the election to address some of these ideas. Um, I don't want to get into some topics of politicizing ideas, but I do feel like it is a high priority in our city that needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed soon. Um, so hopefully, you know, if this is something you're interested in, you can come and participate in some of these discussions to move our recreation center and activities forward. So I appreciate your comments. Um, and as you know, we are deficit spending, and it's really about where do you get the money and how do you prioritize that money. Uh, we have to pay for our police, we have to pay for our fire services, and typically, you know, that's what gets ranked first. And so, um, we will get there, and uh, I appreciate you coming up and saying your comments. Um, as far as the neighborhood meeting, um, I did not invite any council members to the neighborhood meeting. This is, you know, I've had meetings in the past, I've held one of the acres uh, last year, uh, contacted the board about holding another one, which I think is planned for early next year. Um, and I did not invite any council members to this. It's, it's not because I, I don't want their voices heard. It's really kind of a chance to talk to the mayor. Um, and the person that showed up, uh, the council member that showed up, I'm not going to kick the person out. I, it, I'm sorry, it's just not, I'm not going to do that. I did not allow that particular person to speak. Mrs. Grodek was at that meeting. She can confirm that. Um, she's a resident in that area. Um, so it wasn't a slight, it wasn't a mayor's people invited, not mayor's people, it was no can no council members invited. And it was really just a chance to, for residents to candidly ask me questions about what's going on and uh, all my directors that really kind of do the day-to-day -day work here in City Hall uh, and, um, and really to get to know them. And it, and it was another chance for a uh, community outreach with our police officers who stopped by, who were on patrol, and uh, so residents can kind of get faces and names together, which um, I, I held two community meetings this past year, another one on Woodhaven uh, for an area by St. Thomas Mark. Um, so I hope nobody's offended by that, but there was nothing intended there. Um, uh, you know, some of these other things that I was going to talk about, I think I'm going to hold off. I'm going to wait till after the election's over. Um, I, I really hope that with all races, people do their homework. 
they listen to what people have to say, if they question some and somebody's past decisions on any particular issues, on any particular votes, that they contact them. I said this at the last meeting, um, and I am telling you to do this here as well. Um, I know issue three has been a hot topic for people to use in their campaign literature, um, you know, and it's, it's a dead issue. I mean, we could beat a dead horse, but the issue's done. And um, it's unfortunate because I don't think all the facts and truths are out there. And, but that's not gonna change. And, and at this rate, it doesn't really matter either. So, um, you know, do your homework, uh, vote for whoever you're gonna vote for on November 7th, and good luck to all the candidates. Thank you, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Mayor. We will now move on to reports of directors. We'll begin this evening with Mr. Schaefer. Thank you. I want to start off by thanking members of council for their continued involvement in the process of determining the 2018 permanent appropriations, including feedback of the, the 2018 capital items. I know sitting through four budget work sessions, two hours apiece, can be grueling, but um, by passing the 2018 permanent appropriations by the end of 2017, this streamlines the city's budgeting process and those efficiencies will, will carry into 2018 and beyond. So thank you for your help with that. Another efficiency gain by this is condensing the 2018 capital list into, legis into a legislative package for city departments to move forward with these planned purchases starting in 2018 instead of introducing single pieces of legislation each time a, time a capital item is purchased. This will be most helpful in getting the city's 2018 paving program lined up over the winter months so the paving work can start er earlier than in previous years. We hope that go by going out to bid in the winter months may help the city obtain the best and lowest bids from contractors trying to line up work for the spring of 2018. So at a very high level, I want to keep you apprised of the 2018 budget process I'm envisioning. I'd like to present the 2018 permanent proposed appropriations to city council for first reading on Monday, November 13th, meaning the 2018 permanent appropriations would be lined up for third reading and adoption on Monday, December 11th. Based on feedback obtained from the four council budget work sessions, plus the finance committee meeting tonight, I'll incorporate your feedback into the 2018 permanent appropriations presented for first reading next meeting. I will likely be absent from the November 13th city council meeting. Joanne Haig will be attending the finance committee and the city council meeting in my absence. I'll have access to my emails for you to provide questions, comments, concerns, or feedback, and Joanne will be here to answer your questions. As discussed at the budget work session last Monday, the 16th, City Council will also be presented with legislation to execute the city's transfers and advances at the November 13th City Council meeting. Uh, I provided the, the scheduled 2017 transfers and advances as part of the City Council um, package for the work session and um, back when we approved the 2017 permanent appropriations please let me know if you have any questions about those transfers and they look very similar to 2016. The resolution up for first reading tonight 2017-13 is routine legislation notifying the county fiscal officer to advance taxes in the form of two payments instead of waiting to disperse one lump sum. This, on, this is on first reading tonight, so please let me know if you have any further questions about this piece, about this resolution. Um, it was mentioned that um, to describe the um, changes to section 182.02 of chapter 182 of the city's income tax ordinance, um, and this needs to be updated to comply with Ohio Revised Code Chapter 718, Section B4. Changes were made to the Chapter 182 of the City's Income Tax Code back in November 2015. Rita recommended that the $5 million threshold be eliminated for the lottery winnings at that time. To conform with the changes to House Bill 5 that was effective 1-1 of 2016, where these thresholds are no longer valid, we're updating the language in that administrative code to conform with the House Bill 5 changes effective 1-1 of 2016. 
to continue with the what I'm envisioning for the remainder of 2017, I hope to be able to present City Council change number two to the 2017 permanent appropriations by emergency on December 11th, the council meeting December 11th, with the hope that those are the final appropriation changes for 2017. I also want to avoid a situation where change number two to the 2017 permanent appropriations being passed by emergency would be a surprise to members of council. But I must make sure that the city certificate of estimated resources are in balance and certified by the county fiscal officer prior to the end of 2017. If an emergency comes up to throw the city certificate out of balance in the last three weeks of operation in December, then again, I reserve the right to request a change number three to be approved by emergency on the 1226 City Council meeting. Um, I want to mention that the Finance Department has fielded a large uptick in residents coming to City Hall to resolve local income tax issues with Rita. If you received a letter from Rita, you have until next Monday, the 30th of October, to respond to that letter or an administrative subpoena will be issued to you um, and you will be scheduled to appear at City Hall in front of Rita during the week of November 27th to resolve any outstanding issues. The easiest and quickest way to resolve these issues is electronically. File your past returns in Rita's e-file system by going to www.ritaohio, Ohio is spelled out, dot com. That's www.ritaohio.com. And you can also fax any of the requested information from those letters to area code 440-922-3510. That fax line is 440-922-3510. Or you can call Rita directly at 1-800-860-7482. Again, that's 1-800-860-7482. And they will be able to help you with any of those outstanding issues. Besides the proposed 2018 permanent appropriations, we discussed several. <laughs> you may have to use the podium, Mr. Shaker. Back on. We Almost there. You're so close. Thank you. Try. So besides the 2018 proposed permanent appropriations, we discussed several topics during the last City Council budget work session on the 16th. We, we discussed the recently updated 2017 RETA projections, and the City is projected to receive $14.4 million in gross municipal income tax collections during 2017. And this is higher than the $13.9 million previously projected back in August. Compared to 2016 gross collections, Rita's assumed that the city will lose another $450,000 in both November and December of 2017. Through the first 10 months of 2017, the city's lost an average of $368,000 per month compared to 2016 collections. We also got an initial 2018 projection from Rita for municipal income tax collections. And that figure, the $14.4 million that has been projected for 2017, Rita's projected an increase from 2017 to 2018 in the range of 1.5% to 2% increase. That 1.5% increase would be $14.6 million, whereas a 2% 2 increase, 2017 to 2018 gross collections, would be $14.7 million. So we also discussed some of the known factors for economic development. Some of the companies were mentioned in the reports of council and the mayor. And we had um, an initial revenue projection for uh, general fund of 2018. Um, we're projecting 15 and a half million in total general fund revenue for 2018. And that's what we're trying to build the 2018 permanent appropriations off of. Besides that, the other change, um, we, pr we provided a list of changes from the initial 2018 capital request versus the 2018 proposed uh, capital list. And that concludes my report.
Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Sorry about that. Uh, next up is our fire chief, Chief Summit. Wake up over there. <laughs> I'll keep it brief. Um, just wanted to report on the open house that we had last week. It, it went very well. We had about 80, 85 personnel come through or public residents come through. Um, on Halloween night, the fire department will be out to support the police department uh, roving the neighborhoods. And I wanted to remind uh, the veterans in our city that uh, we will be having the second annual Veterans Breakfast on Saturday, November 11th from 9 a.m. to noon. That is for all veterans and their spouses or boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other. Um, so that's it. Concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Next up is our police chief, Chief Moki. Thank you. I just wanted to remind everybody that Tuesday, October 31st is Halloween. It'll be from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And as uh, Chief Zemek said, we'll be out uh, handing out candy. Um, and some extra patrols. So leave your light on if you want to give out candy. If you want to be a grump, then don't. <laughs> Chief. Uh, next up is our law director, Mr. Butler, and I apologize, sir. You'll have to make the long walk across the floor. My pleasure. Thank you for the floor. Uh, I have three items to address all in response to some questions tonight. Uh, the first is resolution 2016-5. Um, that is the resolution that we are asking uh, be removed from uh, being held in advance and uh, uh, returned to the active docket. That resolution would declare city council's intent to vacate a portion of uh, the currently existing Montgomery place, which sits at the uh, eastern end of Manoa Avenue off of Tiedemann. The southern portion of Montgomery Place, uh, for the benefit of the audience, is a portion of roadway uh, dedicated uh, uh, many years ago, accepted by the city as a street, uh, but not used as a street ever since it was accepted. In fact, it's paved like a driveway, and it serves right now chiefly as the existing driveway for the home that sit the, sits at the easternmost uh, end of Manoa. Um, that home's garage, in fact, empties out onto that driveway, um, also known as Montgomery Place, uh, and does not have a dedicated drive of its own. So um, uh, the city not uh, being in the business of maintaining this particular stretch of roadway, uh, it's very small, um, would like, uh, to, at least the administration, uh, would like council to agree to vacate a portion of it. What we've done tonight is update the resolution with a legal description of the portion of the roadway that would be vacated. Vacation, of course, means that we are relinquishing our rights to hold on to this land as street property and instead returning it uh, to uh, private ownership. We have not made any official determinations at this point as to who the private owner would be. That would come with later legislation. But we have been in active discussions with Mr. Dudar, who owns the property at the end of uh, Manoa and whose uh, garage empties out onto this drive. Uh, we have come to some uh, preliminary agreement with Mr. Dudar uh, on the uh, amount of roadway to be vacated, and uh, that is what appears before you this evening. So we would ask right now for two votes on uh, Resolution 2016-5. The first being to remove it uh, from abeyance, return it to the active docket, and the second to amend uh, as if on second reading uh, by including the updated Exhibit A. The second item that I'd like to address uh, is the question from Councilwoman Valbeer with respect to the charter amendment on the November ballot um, uh, concerning zoning. Uh, that charter amendment would clarify, it chiefly serves to clarify the language that's in our existing charter as to what a zoning measure, zoning or rezoning measure means. It has been the uh, interpretation under the existing charter that a zoning measure or, or rezoning measure means a measure that council would take to either zone existing land 
or rezone existing land to serve as some other type of use. Um, it would not be, for example, a, a simple change to the zoning code, uh, for example, the height of shrubs allowed as a front yard fence, something like that. That type of measure would not have to go on the ballot under the existing charter or under this language that has been proposed by the Charter Review Commission. Instead, what would be subject to automatic referendum, what would have to go onto the ballot, is any piece of legislation that would actually have the effect of rezoning or zoning land. Um, so I want to make clear that no interpretation of the existing charter changes uh, under this new uh, proposed charter amendment. Um, the same exact types of measures would go before the voters for automatic referendum vote uh, as would go to the voters under the existing charter. Uh, so nothing uh, in direct response to Councilwoman uh, Pucci's question, nothing would change um, under the proposed language of the, of the charter. Now, that provision does a couple of other things. It clarifies that those votes, those public votes, when the public does get to weigh in, on charter on, on zoning uh, changes that those votes can occur not only in special and general elections but also in primary elections and then the final change clarifies that the newspaper publication announcing that particular vote needn't occur in two newspapers of general circulation in the city of Brooklyn but just one and the real reason for that is that uh, it's uh, difficult to find two publications now to newspapers of general circulation in the city, in any city, frankly, around here. Uh, so we think one newspaper uh, suffices in that regard. Uh, I hope that answers your questions, and if not, I'm happy to answer any additional questions you've got on that. Uh, finally, um, uh, Councilwoman Pucci asked me to clarify that 2017-76, that's an ordinance with respect to the HMI Industries Job Retention and Creation uh, Grant, uh, has been amended. The, uh, and maybe that is not a, a fair restatement of the question, but what I can say is the Economic Development Committee on October 10 approved a revised version of that job creation retention contract. What I am not certain about is whether or not that revised version made its way onto the docket on October 10th for Council's first reading. And so I, we, we, I will not ask tonight um, for an amendment uh, because we're not certain whether or not you've got the amended version that was adopted by the Economic Development Committee. Um, go ahead. May I be recognized? Um, and they were the changes per our discussion. We had a conference call. That's correct. Okay. Those and changes were brought before the Economic Development right. Committee. Right. And I did get that in an envelope. You did? Yes. We're just not certain if those have been published yet. And so I would, I would encourage council just to proceed as you normally would in second reading this evening, send it to third reading. We can address any amendments at that point. Okay. Right. May I ask one more question? Um, just to clarify, because the question that I've been getting from residents regarding the charter change is not just changing any zoning, but if you could just reiterate that that would also include adding a new chapter to the zoning code would also still go on the ballot. That's the primary concern. Well, and if and we there's no change. If, that's a good question. If the council and the planning commission work together to add a chapter to the uh, zoning code on, let's say, fences, that does not have the effect of zoning or rezoning land. That would not be subject to an automatic referendum. If, on the other hand, a new district were created, that would have the effect of zoning or rezoning land. Right. And that's what I've been telling residents. And that would go to the voters for an automatic referendum. Okay. Thank you. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Council members, anything in addition? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Butler, just, um, we did amend it because I have the corrections here that I did read the last time around. I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, That's 2076. Uh, uh, yeah, under issuance of grant, we changed the 33,000 to 37,500 um, in here. And so it, it was changed, but I mean, it's fine if you want that's, to. That's, that's terrific. What I do remember, Council Manning on the floor, was another ordinance with respect to um, 
cost recovery. I don't. I didn't remember those changes. We did, but so. you know what? Just for to make sure, we'll just we'll just wait till next time. That's fine. That's that, that's great. I mean, if it, it was actually we, it, there was a motion to amend on the floor. Yes. Uh, that's yeah. wonderful. Then I think it's you are. It's not reflected in the minutes then. I see, and we'll have to update the minutes for that. Well, we'll double check on that for next meeting. Okay. And um, if we have to, we can we can certainly adjust it then. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Okay, we will now move on with the uh, legislation for this evening. The first thing we have is a request to advertise for bid um, from, the, from the 2018 Street Repair Program. I have a letter uh, dated October 17, 2017 from our service director. It says, Dear Mayor and members of council, I respectfully request authorization to advertise for bids for the 2018 Street Repair Program through CW Courtney Company, which includes Torrance Avenue, Orchard Avenue, and Delora Avenue. As in the past, CW Courtney will provide the specifications for the project. The engineer's estimate of project cost for the completion is $1,372,300. Any comments or questions on that? Move to authorize the advertising for bids. Second. Okay. Advertise for bids, Mary Belbert. Yes. Kevin Tansky. Yes. Barb Kulitsky. Yes. Ron Van Kirk. Yes. Tony DeMarco. Yes. Debbie Tomasco. Yes. Kathy Pucci. Yes. Next up is resolution 2016-5. Decla this is the first item that Mr. Butler uh, addressed, declaring City Council's intent to vacate a portion of Montgomery Place, South Manoa Avenue, and requiring notice to be published and declaring an emergency. The first motion per Mr. Butler is that we uh, take a vote to remove from abeyance. Move to remove from abeyance. Second. To remove from abeyance, Mary Belvere. Yes. Kevin Tansky. Yes. Barb Politsky. Yes. Brian Van Kirk. Yes. Tony DeMarco. Yes. Debbie Tomasco. Yes. Kathy Pucci. Yes. Next, we'll need to amend, and I have to. I will read into the record the amendments. Um, this is from uh, our surveying company, the Western Reserve Surveying Company, dated October 14, 2017, as the legal description of part of Montgomery Place to be vacated, Parcel A. Situated in the city of Brooklyn County of Cuyahoga, the state of Ohio, and known as being part of Montgomery Place, formerly West 100th Street, dedicated in the R.P. Clarkland Company, Tiedemann Road allotment, of part of original Brooklyn Township, lot number three. As recorded in volume 76 of maps, page 26 of Cuyahoga County Records, and more fully described as follows. Beginning at a point at the intersection of the southerly line of Manoa Avenue, 50 feet wide, with the western line of Montgomery Place, 30 feet wide. <coughs> Thence, south, 0 degrees, dash 24, by 50, 24 foot by 50 inches, west along the westerly line of Montgomery Place, as aforesaid, 15 feet to a point in the principal place of beginning. Thence, continuing south, 0 degrees, 24 feet, 50 inches west along the westerly line of Montgomery Place as aforesaid, 120 feet to a point at the southerly line thereof. Thence, south, 89 degrees, 35 feet, 0 inches east along the southerly line of Montgomery Place as aforesaid, 30 feet to a point on the easterly line of Montgomery Place as aforesaid. Thence, north, 0 degrees, 24 feet, 50 inches east along the easterly line of Montgomery Place, 120 feet to a point. Thence, north, 89 degrees, 35 feet, 0 inches, west 30 feet to a point in the principal place of beginning and containing 0.0826 acres of land according to the survey by the western reserve surveying company in october 2017 be the same more or less be the same more or less but subject to all legal highways you know motion to amend move to amend is read into the record second to amend mary bill beard yes kevin tansky yes barb politsky yes brian van kirk yes Tony DeMarco? Yes. Debbie Tomasco? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. This is on second reading. May I be recognized? Yes. I just want to thank Mr. Butler for all his work on this, and I also want to thank Mr. Dudar, who's in the audience, for his patience yeah. as we worked our way through this very long process. Thank you. Next up is Ordinance 2017-74. Is up for a third reading adoption this evening. Amending Ordinance 2017-22. Authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Cost Recovery Corporation, LLC, for billing and related services attributed to fire department incidents. Any comments or questions? Move to adopt. Second. To adopt. Mary Bilbert? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. Barb Politsky? Yes. Ron Van Kirk? Yes. Tony DeMarco? Yes. Debbie Tomasco? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. The next three are on second reading. Resolution 2017-11. <coughs> Authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with the District Board of Health of Cuyahoga County for health services for the year 2018. Ordinance 2017-75, the amended annual appropriations. Ordinance 2017-76, authorizing the mayor to enter into a job retention and creation grant agreement with HMI Industries Incorporated. The next two are new this evening around first reading. 
Resolution 2017-13, requesting the county fiscal officer to advance taxes from the proceeds of the 2017 tax levies pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code, Section 321.34, and Ordinance 2017-77, to amend Section 182.02 of Chapter 182, Income Tax Effective January 1, 2016, of the codified orders of the City of Brooklyn, Ohio. That concludes our agenda for this evening. Do any directors, the mayor, members of council, anything you'd like to say? Yep, I hate one thing. Mr. Chancellor? Yes, I don't want to forget Bob Headings on his happy retirement, long retirement, and also a job well done, and I believe you displayed those fireworks at the Brooklyn football game. So job well done there. Thank you. Very good. Excuse me. Yes, Mr. Um, and one thing I forgot to comment on is um, as people are looking to vote on the Ohio issues, issue two, which I know has been incredibly controversial and confusing, um, again, if you want to see the facts, John Houston, H-U-S-T-E-D, or Secretary of, State of, Secretary of State of Ohio, has a website that has it all explained in clear language, and he's been publishing things in the Cleveland Plain Dealer um, there was one in the past Sunday's paper that looked at issue one and issue two, and it has both pro and con, as well as a copy of the actual um, legislation so that you can read for yourself. So as you're trying to sort through that stuff and do your research, again, John Houston, the Ohio Secretary of State website, has all of that spelled out to help you make a clear decision. Anyone else? In motion. Adjourn. Second. To adjourn, Mary Bill Beard? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. Barb Kulitsky? Yes. Brad Van Kirk? Yes. Tony DeMarco? Yes. Debbie Tomasco? Yes. Kathy Yes. Thank you for attending. Have a blessed evening. Good evening, everyone.